want to welcome folks back to our next weekly coronavirus conversation. And our special guest this week is Sarah Chase. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, David. Nice to see you again. Why don't you tell folks where you're coming from? I am coming live from New York City. Um, I'm originally from Kent, Connecticut, though. So this is about 90 miles south of Kent, Connecticut. Um, I'm admiring your background. Nice touch with the fl roses. Yes, I, I tried. I'm trying to get my foot. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Very good. Uh, so do you remember how you got connected with the Margaret Chase Smith Library? Uh, well, I think I posted something on Facebook about um, wanting to do a film about Margaret, and this was probably back in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember getting a, a quick response from the library, but then I also got a, an email, I think it was either from you, I think it was from you directly, um, uh, inviting me to, to Maine at some point. When my husband and I were living overseas in Frankfurt at the time, Frankfurt, Germany. And, um, and I think that we had, had uh, when we were first moving back to New York City, I, I wanted to visit the library. And I think I either reached out to you or you had contacted me via Facebook, one or the other, and uh, got up to, to visit Skowhegan um, and visited the library uh, when we got back to the States, and I think it was 2013. And then, um, and then I also met you again through uh, Laura Lindenfeld, who had been the director of the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center at the University of Maine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, I think, a really wonderful dinner uh, at Eventide in Portland and uh, got to, to get to know both of you a little bit better. And it was, uh, it's been a wonderful relationship ever since. Well, we're very pleased that you made the connection. Uh, and you've had lots of dealings over this time with our librarian, Angie Stockwell. Yes, Angie is, is a living legend in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> she is. And she keeps very extensive files. So there's a Sarah Chase file. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I asked her, because uh, my, my recollection was pretty much the same as yours, uh, about the same time period and the same uh, interest. But as I went through, I actually found an email from Sarah Chase all the way back in 2004. Oh, wow. Uh, would you have been working in Washington, D.C. at that time for something about rural something? Uh, 2004, I, w I think I was still working for the Federation of American Consumers and Travelers. Okay, in, in Washington, D.C.? In, yeah, in D.C. I was, I was the head of their uh, Washington office. Yeah, you sent an email at that time um, requesting information about Margaret Chase Smith's Declaration of Conscience. Oh, you know, I do remember this. You know, and, I, and somewhere in all of the files after moving back and forth through different countries, I know I have a response from you. This, this just popped into my mind. Mm -hmm. I still have the manila envelope, I think, with um, some of the pamphlets that you had sent from, okay. um, with, with the Declaration of Conscience speech. Oh, okay, yeah. We, we had a, a brochure that we used to distribute, yes. uh, the, which had the whole speech on it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you actually go back quite a ways now, back to 2004. Uh, but then we reconnected over this interest that you had in um, a Margaret T. Smith movie. Mm -hmm. So can you talk, elaborate more on that? Well, Margaret herself is a perfect topic for a movie, and I think right now. Um, and, you know, things have certainly changed in the film and, and entertainment industry. So I think when I initially contacted you, um, Netflix and some of these other things hadn't quite taken off like they have now. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly see more drama or docu-series. Um, you know, the, I think the best example for something like Margaret is is The Queen. Um, or The Crown, sorry, not The Queen. Um uh, and, you know, that's because her life, uh, her political career was sort of so extensive and you have so many years and so many people who she met um, and so many experiences that she had, it, it, it does and does not lend well to a film. So a film arcs on drama and it's got to have a lot of sort of, you know, sensationalist moments in there. And there's got to be sort of like the, the aha moment and all these other things that need to happen in a very short two hour time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're dealing with somebody's life that's so complex and that spans, especially that, that political career that spans, you know, from the 1940s to the 1970s and, and, and you know, really beyond that too, because you're looking both at her, her life holistically and then her life in sort of the, the immediate political realm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that lends better to a series because you can tell more of that, that arching story without needing to smash it into like a two hour, you know, time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and in the conversations that I've, that I've started to have with some of the people um, here in New York and then also out in Hollywood, the, um, the idea of a series, I, can, I think, bodes a little bit better anyway because um, you have more flexibility. Uh, Amazon, Netflix, and certainly some of these, I think, um, new streaming services are, are much more compelled by um, having something that's, uh, you know, th that they can sort of play out a little bit longer with. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the actresses, too, who, who would be interested in playing her uh, are finding that much more appealing, too, because they can really dig into a character. Uh, and a good example now, too, that we have from Hulu was uh, the Mrs. America series. I don't know if, if you saw that recently. No. Uh, that's very well done. It's um, Kate Blanchett as Phyllis Shafley, who mm -hmm. I, <laughs> sort of the antithesis in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had a, a great cast with um, uh, like Margot Martindale, who I love, uh, who played uh, Bella Abzug, and um, Tracy Ullman, who played uh, Betty Friedan. And then I, I forget the woman's name who played... Um, uh, Gloria Steinem, but it, it was, it, it was very well done. It was set during a sort of, um, you know, the, the period of the 1970s transitioning into the, into the Reagan era. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, and that was, I want to say a six or 10 part series. I can't remember, mm -hmm. um, each about an hour long. And that, that really kind of lends itself well to telling Margaret's story. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the ongoing story here for us is that, um, you know, conversations have started to happen. There are a few screenplays that are out there. Um, you at the library were very kind because you shared with me a number of, I, of different screenplays that Margaret had seen in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found each of them fascinating because she had written sort of hand her notes on each of those, um, things that she liked and didn't like. Um, and that, that was very telling as to what the real story behind the story was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, say there's at least a half dozen scripts that have either been completed or discussed uh, and it may even be a little higher than that if you count in some that were for theatrical production yeah yeah and there is a great play too uh linda linda Britt, right i think at the yes. also yep. at the university of maine um has written a really great play called mrs smith goes to washington mm -hmm. and uh, i had a chance to see that with uh uh, with Sally Jones, um, mm -hmm. one of the times Bill and I, my husband, uh, is, his name is Bill. Um, one of the times we were in Maine, we got a chance to see Sally Jones in it. And it's wonderful because it's a scripted theater show. It's a one woman show. Uh, and then at the end, she sort of, she takes on Margaret's character and she takes questions from the audience and it's very extemporaneous. Um, I think my favorite part about that was, um, you know, somebody will raise their hand and said, you know, Margaret was my neighbor or I remember her when I was a child and she did this from our family. Um, and it was great to sort of, see that interaction with the audience and it did feel especially with Sally's portrayal like like Margaret was really in the room. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share screen here because I can uh, show some of the things that you were have referred to. Um, so are you seeing that photo? Yep. All right yep. so there you are in the middle standing next to Sally Jones. And on the far right of the picture is Amber Russell, who has um, been working on a script. And then your husband is on the far left as well. And this is an occasion where you came to Maine and we did a read through of the script that Amber had at that point. Right. Yeah. And the, the script that Amber wrote is now uh, with a production company in LA. Oh, and, really? Well, yeah, that's I nice. haven't. I haven't had a chance to, to reconnect with Amber yet. Um, they're, they're going through it and are making a couple of notes on it. Uh, and then we'll see whether, again, it's a question of whether this is a docu-series, a drama series, or a movie that we have on our hands here. Okay. Well, that's some breaking news because I wasn't aware of that. That's good to know. Yeah, I, I have not given up on this. <laughs> no, I don't you haven't. You're a very determined person. And I, I know these projects often take very long lead times. Yeah, and I got a little sideline working for Alan Alda there for a while too, which uh, became, <laughs> that was a four year commitment of time, which was one of the best times of my life too. Well, and we will touch more on that as we go along. Um, but it's, it's also interesting to hear you say that the changes in the media actually 
may work more to the favor of what would work best for telling the story of Margaret Chase Smith. Yeah, and, and part of that is is some of the political feedback that we've gotten too. Is that the uh, I think the under there's there are sometimes a misconception of of Republican women I think in Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of that has been trying to to overcome I think some of the misconceptions about Margaret, um, and uh, I think now there's there's certainly. Um, there's been a sea change a little bit with the Republican Party um, in in two ways, uh, and there's a little bit of a, a well, there's a, a big fracture I think in it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how that plays out, uh, and and as we're going into this election, of course, I I've never I have a uh, this is very funny, but I have a Google alert set for Margaret Chase Smith so I can sort of stay on top of some of the articles that are out there, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> what I find interesting is that the closer you get to the election cycle the more she has mentioned in the press frequently and constantly um, in relation to her, her uh, speaking out against Joe McCarthy and mm -hmm. the Declaration of Conscience speech. Um, and she really is, I think, for, um, for a certain section of the Republican Party now, really seen as one of those people who was a stalwart um, and I think a, a, a member of the old guard uh, in, in in sort of the old New England version of what the party was like and, and the original the original party of Lincoln um, and a lot of the values that it stood for. Mm -hmm. And I think they were, the Democrats are certainly seeing that as, as um, something that's more aligned with the principles and values that, that they have too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's interesting how Margaret's become sort of a, a nice, um, not she's not a moderate she's not seen as a moderate i don't think but she's certainly seen as somebody who was able to bring together a coalition um between two very disparate factors um and somebody who certainly was was a true unifier of both um both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. do you recall when you first became aware of margaret j smith i well this is funny because um, my grandfather had mentioned her to me frequently when I was a child mm -hmm. um, as somebody who was, you know, either a cousin or, or I, I'm not exactly sure what the relationship was um, with, with him. Um, but my, my, you know, my grandfather was somebody who I remember as, as being the, the head of the Republican town committee. And he was somebody who was always, you know, involved in the election year and was an election official. Um, my grandmother was the, you know, the, the postmaster for the South Kent post office. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my dad was a Marine and there were three chase boys. And um, <clears throat> I think she was, she was seen as somebody in the family somehow who um, definitely was representative of a lot of the values and the principles that um, I think in particular, my, my grandfather wanted to instill in me as much as possible. Um, uh, but I would have been, I think I was 15 when she passed away in 1995. Uh, and I, I wish now that I had had the smarts to um, earlier on, you know, pick up a pen and write her a letter mm -hmm. and say, you know, I'd like to know more about you. Um, I did have the smarts to do that with a woman named Del Eads, who had been our Connecticut state senator, uh, and who was, I, I think, a little bit in the vein of Margaret J. Smith, although drank, a, I, I would say, probably a great deal more scotch. <laughs> um, but Dell Del was certainly somebody who I admired um, as, a, as a really great politician. Um, and she happened to live down the road from us. And I, I did get a chance to interview her a few times um, before she passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dell was also, you know, one of those, those gray-haired fighting little women. She was probably no more than, than four feet 11. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think was if if there was somebody who was close to Margaret J. Smith who I could admire at the time, it was it was probably Del Eads. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I I did get into to politics quite a bit when I was younger too, um, and then was a political science major in college. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I that's how I remember learning about Margaret. And then I remember in college for the first time as a political science major um, learning more about her. Uh, and her career and the, the, I think, the sort of dynamic influence she had on the political realm um, in American politics and particularly uh, with women. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's when I first read to her one of her biographies um, and came across um, uh, Janine Sherman's book, too, and, and read mm -hmm. that completely. 
Very good. Um, what, what qualities about Margaret is it that you most admired and has made you, even beyond this early introduction to her, keep with this project um, of trying to get more people to know about her life and career? Well, I th that's, a, I, that's one of the best questions I've ever been asked. Um, and it's, I don't think it's an easy one because there are a lot of things about Margaret that are, that are wonderful and complicated at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, we've had the, this conversation, I think, before. Um, you know, she, I, I love one of the things about her that she was, um, you know, very anti-McCarthy but that at the same time she could be very anti-communist and like mm -hmm. almost more so than McCarthy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So she had this, this sort of spirit about her that, um, that was determined um, that, you know, if you want to talk about women who are persistent, um, there's probably the, the, the most um, persistent woman in all of human history. Uh, but I think it's it's certainly her conscience and her principles that that really stand out more than anything else. I you 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 can't compare her to anybody in politics right now um, because there are so many people who flip flop back and forth and who sort of go along with the tide. Um, but Margaret really knew what she stood for. Um, she knew exactly um, what what the people of Maine wanted from her. Um, she certainly was, I think, I guess as a politician, what I admire most about her was that she really did listen to people mm -hmm. and she took that feedback and she, she aligned the principles of the totality of the main population with the own principles and own values that she had too, which is a very unique thing for a politician to be able to do, mm -hmm. um, to be able to listen and hear what people need. Uh, and then also to align that with the values that you represent in yourself. Um, so I think she was she was a daughter of Maine, um, and in a, in a way that um, nobody else could ever embody and hasn't been able to embody since. Mm -hmm. Very well stated. You mentioned uh, Ellen Alda, and you also mentioned Laura Lindenfeld. Is that? how your connection to Ellen Alda came is through Laura Lindenfeld, who was formerly the director of the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center at the University of Maine? Yes, that's, that's exactly how this story happened. Um, well, I had met Laura when, when we had dinner in Portland mm -hmm. and um, kept in contact with her. And Laura, uh, again, is, is somebody who's a, um, like a force of nature. I've, and I've heard more than one person describe her that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in a good way too, I've got to say, because sometimes forces of nature can also be hurricanes. Um, yes. But Laura, Laura is more of a like a steady, wonderful wind that just keeps things going and, and moving along. Um, and in, I think in that sense, she's a, she definitely has a little bit of the Margaret Chase Smith spirit about her too. Um, and uh, so Laura, uh, I had kept in contact with Laura, and then um, she at one point had things kind of went silent. And this would have been, in, this was four or five years ago um, and in, in the fall and all of a sudden Laura kind of dropped off the radar. I didn't hear much from her and I thought, well, you know, we're, we're going into the holiday season and she's probably really busy with, with her family and with the University of Maine. And then sometime in March, I think I got a um, March of like 2015 or so, I got an email from her um, saying, you know, I'm, I'm I wanted to let you know, but I'm, I'm leaving the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center and I'm going to the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University. And um, my first thought was, Alan Alda's got a, a center for communicating science? I've never, never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I hit Google and, and started learning more about it. And then Laura also said, you know, she's originally from Long Island. Um, this was a chance for her to, to come back to where her family roots are, um, which I, I completely got. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so she, she said, let me, let me get my, my feet kind of, um, or let me, get, let me get myself settled in here a little bit. And then, uh, you know, let's, let's go out for dinner and, and just kind of reconnect here. And now that I'm in New York, mm -hmm. um, you're in New York. Sounds like a good, good thing. Uh, and then we did, we reconnected. And she said, you know, you've, you've got a really strong business background. I know you've done some market analysis planning. I know you've worked on a number of different startups and different launches. She said, you know, I think we might have a business model here. Um, and, you know, would you, 
would you be willing to to sit down with me and go through a few of the the portions that might lead to a communication training company mm -hmm. i said sure um, and one thing led to another and all of a sudden i was doing a market analysis for alan alda and and meeting him and uh, uh less than i think six months later we launched a business together which was Tell us more about what that business became and you were involved for, what did you say, four years altogether? Yeah, just about four years. Um, the business became uh, Alda Communication Training, or ACT. Uh, <laughs> Alan Great really liked that acronym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very important. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we, we did a whole bunch of things. Um, we worked with the center. Um, we had actually the first uh, public-private partnership that was set up with the State University of New York. Uh, which became a model for them uh, to use in, in terms of um, creating more business development, um, both for SUNY, for Stony Brook, and, and for the Long Island Corridor. And uh, uh, we did about we did about 150 workshops a year. So we were doing, I think, you know, a pretty sensational business. Um, and had COVID-19 not occurred, we'd, we'd be having probably our, our best year ever. Wow. Um, the model for the business was also very unique in that um, Alan didn't want to keep any of the profits. So he anything that, that came as profit from the business went directly back to the Alda Center. Mm -hmm. So by year two, we were delivering over $650,000 in profit back. Wow. Um, and we had a unique model in that we, we sort of rented some of the professors and some of the people who did the workshops. Mm -hmm. So not only were we giving them profit back in terms of revenue, but we were also paying some of the salaries and subsidizing them to, to be a fully profitable center. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in total, we were giving a little bit more than a million dollars a year back in revenue to them, which was fantastic for a startup organization. Yeah. Um, and then Alan and I also launched a podcast together called Clear and Vivid which has gone on to be, you know, it's had 11 million listeners. I, I uh, produced over hundred episodes for him. Um, and we've had, we had guests like, you know, Tom Hanks, Paul McCartney, uh, Sarah Silverman, Dr. Ruth, and we mm -hmm. have a, a, just a sensational bunch of people on there. And that's something people can still access? Yes, you just go to alanalda.com and the, the link to the podcast is on there. Or if you have Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, you can just uh, type in clear and vivid with Alan Alda and you can subscribe right away. What was the clientele for the workshops? Uh, primarily uh, academic, uh, academic universities. Um, you know, we, we work with Broad Institute, MIT, Harvard, uh, Yale. Um, and then we also work with some very, work with the federal government. Um, NASA was one of our clients, uh, US Fish and Wildlife um, and the, uh, we also worked with um, fairly large foundations like the Gates Foundation, Smith, uh, Smith Scholars, um, and uh, it, it kind of. And then we, we would have corporate clients too. So we had uh, you know some some large pharmaceutical companies. We had um, uh, some uh, health and nutrition related companies, mm -hmm. um, and that was you know it, it sort of it sort of ran the full span of of what you could have for clients. Mm -hmm. In my conversations with uh, Laura Lindenfeld, um, my recollection is her background is in communication and sort of mm -hmm. her idea is that scientists have this vast amount of information, but they don't necessarily do the best job of communicating it to the general public. And so is that essentially what you were trying to do is help uh, scientists better communicate the information they have? Yeah, so scientists are, um, you know, they're, they're, they are sometimes very focused on what they do. And we, when we're talking about scientists, we, we're, we should say probably all of the STEM fields. So we would, we would work with scientists, researchers, mathematicians, um, doctors, mm -hmm. and um, many of them have, I think over the years, you know, and even in the process of getting your PhD, you sometimes have that creativity and that wonder sort of driven out of you a little bit. Um, and the workshops that we did were based on communication and also theater techniques, so using improv. Um, and a lot of that was to help them, one, reconnect with the sense of wonder that they had about what they were doing, um, the values that they brought into this originally. So, you, you know, you, you would have a conversation with a, a, a scientist and, and you would find out, well, well, why did you get into science in the first place? And initially you'd get, well, I wanted to work on this research project involving flies and blah, 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 blah. 
and then you kind of dug under the surface a little bit and, you, and you'd be like, well, you know, my grandfather died of, of colon cancer and I was really fascinated about this relationship between these two things. And we're like, that's the story you have to tell. That's, and all of a sudden that okay. passion in them came yeah. out again. Um, so it was allowing them to sort of reconnect with who they were, um, mm -hmm. reconnecting with their colleagues, and then thinking about how to reconceptualize how they talked about their science. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be bringing out some of the stories. Um, and, you know, that is, that's how people relate to one another. We, we, we relate through story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the big flux of the workshops was really just to, uh, to help them become slightly better communicators, to ditch the PowerPoint, um, no more death bar PowerPoint, <laughs> and, and to have real conversations with people too, and, mm -hmm. and to allow them to kind of be more expressive. How did Alan Alda get interested in this topic? Uh, Alan had done, he's, he's always been a little bit of a, of a well, not a little bit, I, I think a big science fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, he, he certainly learned quite a bit about medicine when he was, when he was playing Hawkeye Pierce and MASH. Hawkeye and Pierce from Crabapple Cove, Maine. Crabapple Cove, right. <laughs> and um, uh, he did in the 1990s uh, a series for PBS called Scientific American Frontiers. And Graham Chedd, who's actually still the, the producer for the podcast, um, was the producer of, of, of Scientific American Frontiers with Alan. Um, and he had the best time of his life talking to scientists. But what he realized was when he was talking to the scientists that they would sometimes go into their, their sort of canned talk. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they did, it got boring. And it, you know, it was boring for him as a host and it was boring for the audience to listen to. So what he worked on with a lot of them was have a conversation with me just yeah. you know ditch ditch the canned speech you know you're not you, you know don't click through the powerpoint presentation talk to me as a human being mm -hmm. um and that's when he sort of discovered too that a lot of the techniques that he had learned as an actor using improv could help the scientists uh, and he was exactly right and then there you know we've done research studies to to help prove that too um and uh i think just the amount of success that we've seen through the, the workshops and, and through the work at Stony Brook uh, and the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science has been exceptional. So it sounds like you found uh, a very profitable and important niche. And it also sounds like it was really the pandemic that brought it to a halt. It wasn't that you ran out of potential clients. It's Really no, the no, and, and I, I should say too that the All in All the Center for Communicating Science is still going strong, um, okay. and that the the company was was sort of an an it was an asset to to the workshops, um, but it was not a necessity. Uh, and um, what we learned with the pandemic was that uh, that in order for the All in All the Center for Communicating Science to really kind of go forward. Um, we were going to have to cut some of the costs of the company uh, and make sure that, that to, you know, everything was going towards the endowment and, and towards keeping that very much alive. Um, and, but the uh, center is carrying on that work. The yes, yeah. And part of, part of that was a transition to things that could be done online. Um, and, it, you know, this year would have been, I think, our bumper year, uh, but you can't have 150 experiential in-person workshops right now. Uh, so that really kind of, and, and one of the, the function part of the, of the company too, is that we did a lot of the, the backend operations, the management, the travel bookings. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of that was not as much of a necessity this year. Uh, so we sort of took to the sidelines and, um, did our part to keep the center very much afloat. Very good. Uh, before we leave Alan Alda, I want to, I like to do six degrees of separation. So we'll, We'll do that. So Alan Alda was in a movie that starred Leonardo DiCaprio about Howard Hughes. Yep. Howard Hughes became the head of uh, TWA, I believe it was, and ran afoul of federal regulators and in particular a senator from Maine uh, who was on a committee investigating Howard Hughes in TWA. And Shall I say his name? <laughs> well, he's in this picture, yes. Why don't you say his name? Senator Owen Brewster. Yes, who um, had a very colorful career in Maine. And here is a picture of Senator Brewster with uh, Margaret Chase Smith. 
It was uh, it's dated April 1944. And it's at the Republican State Convention in Bangor in 1944. He was probably a senator at that time, and Margaret was um, still a representative. At that time. So uh, I want and to I, portray I Owen Brewster in, in the Howard Hughes movie. I seem to remember too from uh, one of the biographies about Margaret that she and, and Senator Brewster may not have had the best of relations either. Yeah, they represented different wings of the Republican Party. Yep. <laughs> yes. Understandable if any of you have seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, we'll move on from there. And you just, you know, we're just, alluding to the pandemic, and you are in ground zero of what has been the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. And one of the things, we're in Maine, and we're very fortunately have been quite far removed um, from what other parts of the country are experiencing. Uh, but I remember, I think, I, don't, I can't remember if you posted it on Facebook, but you, uh, somewhere I saw pictures that you had taken of the refrigerator trucks. Yeah. In New York City, and that's what drove. That's what really drove it home for me. Yeah, and the impact. Uh, it, it it certainly drove it home for me in in many many ways too. Um, we we live on on the Upper East Side, so we're not we're sort of in between um, uh, Wild Cornell, Lenox Hill, and a lot of the big hospital systems here. And um, we Lenox Hill uh, was in our well, I should say, I'm, we're very fortunate, my husband and I, to live on the Upper East Side um, in that this was, if you, when you search zip code by zip code, we were um, not as affected as many other parts of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, unfortunately, is, is, a, is a consequence of the zip codes and areas in which you live. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we did get a lot of the, oh, um, we did get a lot of overflow from other parts of the city up here. Um, and there was also sort of a precautionary um, measure that was taken, but um, Lenox Hill, which is just a few blocks from where I am, um, brought in all of the refrigerator trucks that were set up outside, which were uh, acting as morgues too. And uh, it was very jarring, I think, to see. Um, and it really, for me, brought home exactly what was going on here. Uh, and that was, they were there, um, I think, from March until just the, just about a few weeks ago when they were taken away finally. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's been a, a, a long series. And we, we had somebody on, on, we're on 71st Street and there was um, in the hospital system on 76. I mean, you, you would hear stories about people walking in in the morning. Um, there was one, unfortunately, a, a police officer who walked in around 6 a.m., wasn't feeling very well. Uh, and then they had turned him away for some reason and he walked halfway down the block and dropped dead. Um, and you know, you, you, the, the stories, um, and I think here in New York, we've, we've certainly been through the worst so far, uh, and are very cautious because of that now. Um, you know, we've, my mother lives in Connecticut and we've only just for the first time gone up there as of the last two months, um, to finally see her. And uh, my, my mother very candidly though said, you know, uh, you know, Sarah, at some point I'm just going to need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> and that also was a, a you know a driver my, my mom's 75 so it was she's in a high-risk category and I was very cautious not to go visit her yeah. um, and uh, my husband dealt with a, a very significant health issue during that time too so we were um, I think in, in particular very very cautious about uh, going outside and dealing with with uh, with the world as it is mm -hmm. Uh, I wish you well in ground zero getting through this. We still have a ways to go, it seems like. Yeah, I, if, if I were anyone listening to this, I'm, I think that um, we have several more months to go until we really understand what's happening. Uh, and I'm, I'm certainly, I'm optimistic for a vaccine, although I, I don't think it's anywhere near um, being ready in time to save us from what could, could potentially be a, a um, significant second wave as as we get into the uh, uh, into the drier weather season, drier and colder weather season. Um, and for anybody who's listening, there is, and this is for you too, David. Um, there was a very good study that that came out of Europe recently that has to do with the humidity levels and making sure that the virus um, particulates don't travel very well. Mm -hmm. So if you get a humidifier, try to keep your house between forty to sixty percent humidity. 
um, get a know. humidifier for each room, and the humidity levels actually keep the virus from being aerosol. I can never say that word properly, but mm -hmm. from from um, from being able to spread as far in in the air as it would be. Mm -hmm. And it's true that that dry air, uh, dry cold air in particular, helps the virus spread. Mm -hmm. So the more humidity you can keep in the air, the the less spread you will get. The more water droplets you have in the air, they sort of make up will be a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. They, they actually weigh it down a little bit, okay. so that's good. Well, and then I've, and cl clean your surfaces. <laughs> I've learned several things today. You're very informative. Well, hopefully, I mean, if, if that saves one person's life, we're, we've accomplished something here. So I want to end on a happy note, and because you talked about, you know, you, you wound up this year living in the place in the United States where coronavirus hit hardest, and as a consequence of that somewhat, you lost your job. I did, yep. But you have landed on your feet. So why don't you tell people what you're doing now? Well, I always try to land on my feet. I, uh, it's better than landing on your head. <laughs> um, slightly less painful. And uh, I was, I've, again, I'm, I'm just, I, I knock on wood, knock on whatever is in here in front of me. Um, I, I'm, all, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I, you know, I must have done something good somewhere along the lines. Um, or, or I meant to do something good. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I got a, um, I f responded to an ad on LinkedIn, um, of somebody who was looking for a publicist because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who can just sort of sit here and not do anything. It's like, you know, the devil's hands or idle hands. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I, I was like, well, I can do some publicity work in the meantime. And, you know, I can at least if I had, you know, I was applying for, for jobs everywhere, but, you know, I thought, well, you know, if I have to take on client work or contract work, that's, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I responded to somebody who was looking for a, a publicist, publicist for their book. And lo and behold, um, I, I wasn't really the best qualified person for the publicist job. Um, but she did say, you know, I've got this production company and your background looks like we're a match. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, yeah, tell, well, I looked at the website and, and we had several conversations. Um, and normally I would never take a job, you know, or, or even consider doing something without meeting somebody first, mm -hmm. um, in a particularly face to face. Uh, but <laughs> well, I wasn't exactly going to fly to LA. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, we had several Zoom conversations, a lot of back and forth, and, and again, she had written a book about her life and her memoirs, um, and it's called, if you want to check it out, her name is Samantha Hart. The company is called Wild Bill Productions, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the book that she's written, um, which I, I hope will be published fairly soon, um, is called Blind Pony, and she's got a website up for it, which is blindpony.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sam Hart has had an amazing life. Um, she was sexually abused as a child, wound up running away to LA when she was 14. Um, the book is a wild read. It's absolutely sensational. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, I hope when it gets published that everybody will go out and get a copy of it because she's also going to have, I think, a really good movie on her hands. <laughs> Do you have any sort of timeline of when the book will be available? Uh, she was going to self-publish it, but the, the, the feedback that she's gotten, um, I think, from everybody who's read it, and then uh, we, we have helped her um, find a more reputable publisher. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a sort of to be determined at the moment. Um, okay. She was thinking October, but I, I think if, if a publishing house is going to pick this up, it, it's going to be slightly delayed because of a, another round of editing. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be out by the first part of 2021. And then you should have her on as a guest because she's okay. just off the walls. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, so Sam, Sam and her husband, James Lipitsky, run One Wild Bill Productions, um, and it's a creative content company. So for anybody who's not familiar with what that is, we do television commercials, documentaries, films, um, digital shorts, graphics, any, any, anything that has to do with content that's available for public consumption. Um, so some of our largest clients are Whole Foods, uh, Rolex, um, uh, North Face. Everybody in Maine must know North Face. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd love to get L.L. Bean. And, uh, and right now, David, if, if the foundation or the library would like anything created, let us know. We'd be happy to do something for you for free um, just to, to collaborate and have some fun. Um, and Sam has also um, been very generous in, in taking a look at the script for the Margaret Chase Smith film. Uh, mm -hmm. She has, a, has had a very good career both at David Gevin Records, um, worked with Nirvana, Guns N' Roses, 
uh, and then worked at Universal Studios uh, and launched some of the bigger movies, better movies of our time, mm -hmm. uh, and then went on to help create focus features too. So I, I have a lot of faith in Sam um, and her understanding of the film industry uh, and helping move this project along too with, with Margaret. Very good. When you uh, shared with me the announcement of your new position, you also included a link to a clip of an example of the types of projects that Wild Bill works on. And it was about an architect named um, Benjamin Marshall, I believe. Mm -hmm. right? And I had never heard of Benjamin Marshall, but he's fascinating. And it was, I believe it was like a 25 minute um, documentary, but it was so informative. And it, yeah. it, is it, can, can the public find that? Uh, Somewhere. Yeah, if, if you go to uh, our website, which is wildbill.la, mm -hmm. you'll, LA as in Los Angeles, you'll, you'll find the documentary on there. Um, there's a couple of others that we've done, um, and plus a lot of our commercial work is on there too. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, yeah, the Benjamin Marshall Society video is there. Uh, that hopefully will be turned into a, a more um, kind of long format series for something like a Netflix um, on architects and architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, which will be partly sponsored by the Benjamin Marshall Society, and um, we're that's still in conversations, but um, that's my understanding of where that project's going to go right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anyone wants the link to watch it, I'd be happy to send it off to you at the library, and we can forward it on to anyone who would like to see it. Mm -hmm. The um, and and of course, uh, I'm not exactly sure of their website link, but you can you can certainly Google Benjamin Marshall Society and find out more about them. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone who's not familiar with him, he is a he is a rather famous architect sort of along the lines of Stanford White um, and Benjamin Marshall designed uh, a number of different beautiful buildings in Chicago, uh, including the Drake Hotel. And what was interesting to me, and we were talking about this earlier in terms of uh, creating a narrative about Margaret Chase Smith, how mm -hmm. these have arcs to them. And what's fascinating about his career is it got off to a very tragic beginning which I don't want to give away, but I mean, <laughs> historically tragic beginning. Yep. And it's sort of a tragic end in that his career waned during the depression. And part of the story is he sort of got forgotten, um, even though during the height of his career, he had been very influential architect in Chicago, which is my favorite architectural city in the United States. Yeah, he's he's just a fascinating character, uh, and um, you know that that's I think that lends well to telling the story about his life too, or those sort of those drama moments that you can mm -hmm. kind of follow and and everybody can relate to. I think that's the the nice part about it, the tragic and nice part at the same time. Yeah, I mean I know I'm I'm not a big person on architecture, but it's just it's a great story. Yeah, and it's very well told. It's basically told with talking heads, but it, it moves really well. I mean. It's only 25 minutes long, but you feel like you've gotten an hour's worth of information. Well, that's our exceptionally good storytelling. I yeah, it say. is. It is. <laughs> I, was, I was very impressed. And that's the reason I try to keep my interviews, my conversations with people to about a half hour. Um, I think right now people are getting a little zoomed out. So yeah, well, I I'm always want to leave them wanting more. <laughs> and Sarah Chase is definitely someone we want to know more about and uh, hopefully we will be able to revisit um, when the Margaret Chase Smith movie comes out. Yes, I'm determined to make this happen. So whether and, it's in two months or two years or 20 years, we will be seeing one another again at the films uh, when you can return to the theater. and At, at the red carpet. Yes, and Margaret will be on the big screen. There you go. Uh, I have complete faith in you. Uh, there are certain people you meet in life who you know are very determined and when they say that they have a plan to do something that it will happen. So. Yeah, and when people keep trying to tell you you can't do it, you, you do kind of like to try. Gee, I wonder where I've heard <laughs> that before. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Sarah, for spending some time with us and sharing all that you've been doing and good luck with your work. Thank you, David, and goodbye to everybody. I hope we can meet again in Maine uh, and, uh, and happier, better times. Yes, we look forward to having you back in Maine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.